Thank you, Walker. And uh, thank you to AIER for having me here this summer and for allowing me to present some of my research. Uh, so the talk that I'm going to give today is um, based on this Cato paper that I wrote, uh, Competition and Currency, the Potential for Private Money. Um, and that was published in their policy analysis uh, paper series just about a month ago. Um, <clears throat> and so the idea that I'm going to talk about today is um, the possibility of having private banknotes in the United States. And what I mean by that is allowing banks to produce and distribute their own notes uh, instead of just having United States Federal Reserve notes. So some of the people um, that are here at AIER for the summer, all the fellows are kind of familiar with this idea already uh, in a way that a lot of, I think, Americans and a lot of uh, economists really aren't. They don't think of it, about it very much. Um, as we've talked about in some of our classes already, for most of US history, most, the majority of the money supply was, was produced by private banks rather than by the government, right? Uh, it wasn't until the Fed was founded in 1913 and then 1914 starts creating currency that, that the US government was really in charge of the currency supply. Um, and I guess there's also some question as to whether they really should have been doing that, whether the Constitution allows for uh, the federal government to be creating paper money. I mean, the, the Constitution says that the government is in charge of coining money and regulating the value thereof, right? But um, we now have Federal Reserve notes, which are essentially a fiat money, and the Federal Reserve manages their value by issuing more or less, right? So for most of the US history, we had private banks producing the notes, and apparently it's still legal today for them to do that. That was, for a while, for, for a long time, it was illegal for private banks to issue notes. And then only recently have some of those laws been repealed. And so I'll talk about that. And the, the status is still a little questionable because no major bank has really taken on uh, that challenge. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's interesting. It, it appears that they're, it's currently legal for them to do this. And I think if they did start doing that, that this would benefit Americans, first of all, by stabilizing the economy, um, and then also just in terms of product variety. So I'll, I'll talk about both of those things a little bit later. Um, so really, I'm, I'm thinking of this sort of in, in three stages. First, I'm going to talk about the Federal Reserve. Um, I think when we consider the Federal Reserve today, you know, how does the Fed do? If you asked, you know, is the Federal Reserve good? Should we have a Federal Reserve? I think economists kind of fall into three categories. Uh, there's one small section of economists that says, the Fed is great. The Fed is always good. They're fantastic. They, you know, they did a great job in, in recent history keeping inflation low. When we had this recent financial crisis, they came in and saved us and bailed us out. Right? And so some economists really believe that the Fed just always gets it right. Uh, the majority of economists don't really believe that, right? I think most of them would say, well, you know, the Fed gets it right a lot of the times. We did have this good period for the last 30 years or something that was the great moderation. Uh, but man, they really dropped the ball in the recent crisis, right? They were bailing out all these banks, even ones that were pretty clearly insolvent and caused a lot of problems. And so I think a lot of economists would say, you know, they, they usually do a good job, but, but sometimes they mess up. Or possibly they might say the other way. They might say, well, you know, the Fed really kind of messed up recently. They, they contributed to the internet stock bubble. They contributed to the recent housing bubble. Um, but then when we had the financial crisis, they came in and saved us, right? And I, so the majority of economists, I think, would clearly fall in that kind of middle category that says, well, the Fed, uh, they get it right most of the time. They mess up sometimes, but they're really important and they do a really good job. Um, and I'm kind of in the other camp that says, look, you know, the Fed messed up in the recent crisis and they always mess it up, right? Not only did they do a poor job in the crisis, they helped contribute to the housing bubble, they co helped contribute to the internet stock bubble before that. In the 60s and 70s, they caused massive inflation and then going back to the Great Depression, I mean, most economists generally agree now that the Fed um, either caused or at least prolonged and deepened the Great Depression, right? I mean, you know, Ben Bernanke and Milton Friedman's 90th birthday said, said, Milton, uh, we admit now, we did it, you were right, but thanks to you, we won't do it again, right? So, I mean, I think economists generally believe that Great Depression, at least partially caused by the Federal Reserve. Um, and so, in my opinion, I think that they, um, that that's not uh, just 
just a random occurrence, I think that's you know, something that they consistently do is that they're more likely to get it wrong than to get it right. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is the Federal Reserve, why we have a Fed, whether they do a good job or not. Uh, the next thing after that, I'm going to talk about alternatives to the Fed. Now, again, you guys I know have talked about this stuff a little bit this semester, so I'll, or this summer. I'll be brief discussing the gold standard in 100% reserves. Um, but I'm going to spend some time talking about free banking, because that's important to understanding the incentives in a freer banking system, why we would think that private banknotes might be a good idea. Right? And then towards the end here, I'm going to address exactly how I think private banknotes could be reintroduced to the United States. OK, so first of all, if we're thinking about the Fed, we should wonder, why, why have a Fed? Like, why do we want a Fed? I mean, what's the point to having one institution that creates all the money for the entire United States? I mean, as economists, we would normally think having a monopoly is a bad idea, right? We would think we want, in any market, lots of producers competing to try to win over the customers. Right? If they have to compete, then they've got to do a better job, whereas if they're a monopoly, then they don't have to respond to customer preference and they don't have to worry about their quality of their products. So it seems a little bit strange that money is kind of the exception to that, right? that we want one single provider of money. Okay? So I think most of the time, the reason that economists say that is because we worry about the money supply. Um, Money is obviously very important in, in the whole country. I mean, every transaction is half money and half goods. Uh, and so economists think, well, we really kind of need somebody to manage the money supply because it's so important. That seems a little bit weird to me. I mean, we would think food, that's really important, but we let the market do that. But most economists would say, you know, managing the money supply in order to keep the economy going, that's, that's the most important thing. We need the Fed to do that. Right? And kind of their goals when they, when they think about what the Fed should be doing. The number one thing, I wrote reduce inflation here. What, what I really mean by that is that the Fed is in charge of putting the right amount of money into the economy. Okay? So the goal of monetary policy is that each year the economy grows just a little bit. Right? On average, I mean, it's usually growing. Uh, and so each year, people need a little bit more money in the economy so that they can make their transactions. Right? More, more money in the economy means it's easier for us to go out and buy and sell stuff. Okay? So as the, as the economy grows, we need a little bit more money each year. But we don't want too much or too little. Right? We want the amount of money introduced to be proportional to the amount of growth we have. Right? If we introduce too much money, then we get inflation. If we introduce too little, then we might get deflation. Okay, so that's kind of the number one goal of the Fed or of any central bank is to supply the proper amount of money so that the economy can grow. Um, part of that is um, having good GDP growth. I mean, the reason that we want the proper quantity of money um, is because when we have the right amount, when we have the supply of money equaling the demand of money, then that allows the economy to grow and it allows people to you know, make transactions in the economy and have, grow their businesses. And so that's really the bottom line, is that the reason we want the, the quantity of money to be correct is because we want to have better GDP growth. Right? And so a lot of economists would say, that's why we need the Fed, is because the Fed's got to be in charge of the money supply so that we can keep our growth every year going up and up and up. Right? Now, a more uh, recent theme in principles or, or reasons for having a Fed is that we think the Fed can maybe help tame the business cycle. Okay? So we're going to have cycles in any economy where things are going well for a little while, then they go into a bust, and they're up and down. And the idea here is, well, when things go badly, when we get into a recession, then the Fed can come in, they can put a bunch of money into the economy and turn things around and get us going again. Right? So when we get into a downturn, they can crank it up and get us going. And if we're going too hot, the Fed can take some money out of the economy and tone it down. So the idea is that they would smooth the business cycle a little bit so that we have consistent growth year after year instead of kind of being up and down. Right? Now that idea is, is more recent. When the Fed was founded, I don't think it was the goal um, of the Federal Reserve to try to dampen the business cycle. Really, they were, they were saying, look, we just need um, money to be secure. Uh, but I think nowadays economists would say, that's really the primary job of the Fed. We don't worry about inflation. We intentionally have some inflation every year uh, in order that we can help manage the business cycle a little bit. Okay. And then the last thing here is that a lot of people would say, well, we need the Fed to regulate the banking system. Now, again, we've talked a little bit in this session about how those two things are really quite different. The Fed, as the manager of money, doesn't also need to be the person that 
that is regulating the banking system. In fact, some people have argued those things really should be separated. Uh, but I think for most economists, they would argue that, well, the money is really created in the banking system. The Fed influences that, uh, but they should be in charge of banks because that's where, where the money creation really happens, right? So we need the Fed to come in to audit banks, to making sure they're not being too risky, that they're holding enough capital. Um, and when they do have problems, the Fed needs to be there to bail them out, right? The Fed needs to be the lender of last resort. Uh, and so all those things, even though that's not an essential function of the central bank, Right? The central bank's main function is to manage the money supply, uh, but taming the business cycle and regulating the banking system are certainly things that a lot of economists thinking, think are important um, jobs of the Fed. So if these are the important characteristics of having a central bank, we can now look back at almost 100 years of history with the Federal Reserve and say, how has the Fed done? Has the Fed accomplished these goals? Were they better than the system that we had before when we allowed private banks to create their own money? I think the, failed is actually, the Fed has failed on every margin here. I think if we look at these things, I mean, again, a lot of people are saying, look, GDP growth is the most important thing. Well, before the Fed, uh, for US history, we had about 4.5% average, average annual GDP growth. Since the Fed, we've actually had about 3.5%. Um, now, of course, that, that doesn't necessarily mean that private bank notes uh, were the thing that created that growth. I mean, I, I guess a lot of people would say, well, there were different things going on. You know, there were, um, the economy was much different back then, and it wasn't the money supply that was creating that growth. Okay, that's fair. I think that's fair. But, but the, um, the claim that's made by people that are for the Fed, that the Fed will give us better GDP growth, okay, that's certainly not true, right? We can see that, that on that margin, they've clearly failed. Um, recessions, OK, so this is about managing the business cycle. Recessions have not been less frequent nor less severe, right? And then when we se say severe, we mean the length and depth of recessions has not been any better since we had the Fed, right? So um, a lot of economists uh, aren't aware of that fact, I think. I think there's a general perception that, well, the Fed has done a great job making things you know, better. Um, but I think a lot of the recent research shows that that's not going to be the case. And the, the most famous uh, economists working on this are a lot of the research has been done by Christina Romer, right, who was Obama's uh, chairperson of the Council of Economic Advisors. So hardly any kind of right-wing ideologue or someone. This is a major researcher at Stanford University publishing in very highly ranked journals. And when she looks at the data, she says, the Fed has not done a better job. In fact, this is not even looking at all the Fed history. She does the Fed a favor by not counting the Great Depression, right? Leaving out the biggest mistake ever made, the greatest recession in US history, the Fed's still not as good, right? This is only looking at since World War II versus before the Fed. Um, and then there's another, uh, another economist, uh, Davis. Um, I can't recall his first name, but he also has some recent research where he takes the data further back and comes to the same conclusion. The Fed has not tamed the business cycle because recessions were not any less frequent nor less severe, right? Well, what about banking panics? I mean, this is the goal of banking regulation, right? That was kind of one of, one of our next things was, is the Fed good at banking regulation? Uh, it doesn't appear to be so. Right? Banking panics, not less frequent or less severe. But I should point out, this is only looking at pre-FDIC. So from 20 years of the Fed, from 1913 to 1933. Um, after that time, I mean, I think FDIC is really the thing that most economists would say, that's what really stopped the bank runs. Right? Once we told people, look, even if the bank fails, the government will still give you your money, that basically stops the problem of bank runs. And we've had very few since then. Um, but that's not the Fed. Right? The argument is, if people are saying, well, the Fed is preventing panics by regulating the banking sector, no, that's definitely not the case. Okay? Um, and Ronnie, I guess, has talked about how reasons why FDIC, you know, maybe not a great idea, um, but if we exclude the FDIC period, we can say for sure that the, uh, the banking panics have not been better under the Fed. In fact, if we look at the period post-Civil War to the founding of the Fed, so this is something like, um, 1865 to 1913, so roughly a 50-year period, three major financial panics. From 1913 to 1933, five major financial panics, right? So when we look at the Fed, is, did the Fed do a good job regulating banks? No, it doesn't appear that they did any better. In fact, they may have done worse. 
Um, as far as the lender of last resort, I think that that one, if people say, again, okay, the, Granted, there are some people that say the Fed got it right in the, in the recent financial crisis. They came in and saved us. Uh, I don't think that most economists think that. Right? I think most economists think that they kind of, kind of you know, botched that one. Um, and then the other major time, again, is the Great Depression, when I think economists generally agree the Fed did a pretty poor job. So as far as the lender of last resort, again, a regulating job of the Fed doesn't have to be part of the Fed's job, but most economists would say it's important that the Fed do that, and yet they haven't done a very good job, right? Uh, and then the last thing, this is, this is the first thing that I mentioned on the other slide because it's the most important job of the Fed, but I saved it for last because it's the thing that the Fed has done the worst at is preventing inflation, right? So before the Fed, before the Fed for something like 120 years, cumulative total of 3.6% inflation. Less than 100 years since the Fed, more than 2,000%. And I think depending on what you look at, it's somewhere between which measure of inflation, somewhere between 2,200% um, and 2,600%. So uh, either way, it, it, it's not even close, right? Basically, before the Federal Reserve, we had almost no inflation on average, right? We did have some inflations and some deflations. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but we would say cumulatively, Fed clearly has done a, a terrible job um, containing inflation. So here's a graph of the value of the dollar just since uh, 1970, right? We're only talking about 40 years here. Um, but if we took the value of the dollar at 100% in 1970 and see how, what its value is worth since then, it's fallen to about 20%. This ends in 2009. I think now it's actually slightly below 20%. Um, but we can see because of inflation, the dollar has lost 80% of its value in only 40 years, right? So again, that's something that the, the Fed has not done a good job of maintaining the value of the dollar, which was, again, their original goal, their original job, okay? So why does that matter? I mean, you guys have heard a lot with Walker and Ronnie both talking about inflation. Well, inflation is, is bad for the economy. I know that some people sometimes just think, well, the prices rise and so what? It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. Okay, inflation has lots of bad effects on the economy. So first of all, inflation is a tax on the holders of money. Okay, Any, anyone that's, that has a dollar, when there are more dollars in the economy, your dollar is worth less. Okay, so the federal government can exploit that. They can print up money and buy stuff, and the federal government gains, but the holders of dollars lose. Right? So if the, if the government is gaining and the dollar holders are losing, that's essentially a tax on dollar holders. Okay, so that's a big deal. Part of the reason that it's a big deal is because that creates deadweight losses in the economy. Okay, if, we think of the, if we think of inflation as being a tax, well, people are trying to avoid the tax, right? They're trying to, they have to contract around it. They have to find, find ways to avoid all that inflation. Uh, or a lot of times they just don't transact. I mean, there are probably a lot of deals in the economy just don't get done because people don't know what inflation is going to be like. Right? They want to sell a product or create a new um, business, and they don't know what prices are going to be like 10 years from now. So they have too much uncertainty to be able to do, um, do those kind of deals, and that means deadweight losses in the economy. Right? Another thing that inflation causes is a wealth transfer um, from creditors to debtors. Right? So, um, so the federal government uses this all the time because if the US issues bonds, right? and we owe, we owe someone a trillion dollars, well then we inflate the economy and we make, we make the value of the dollar worth less, right? And then we don't have to pay them back as much. So that's a tool that the, the uh, government can use. The US government maybe doesn't do that as much, but clearly in a lot of smaller economies, um, we see the federal government using the central bank to inflate away its debts, right? I think that's pretty common in a, in a lot of places. Um, we may end up seeing that in, in Greece a little bit more and maybe in U.S. history. I mean, in, in the future of the U.S., some people are arguing, look, that's the only way that we're going to be able to get out of the giant debts that we're putting up. Right? So that's possible. I don't know. Um, oh, misallocation of resources. So this, I think, is something important as well. When, when 
the Federal Reserve influences interest rates, it'll make some deals look good relative to, to others, right? It'll make some types of investments look good relative to others. So, you know, if, I'm, if I own a business, I'm thinking about building a new factory, uh, it's not profitable, then suddenly the Fed lowers interest rates and I can get a, get a better loan at a lower rate, then I think that I can go ahead and, and uh, invest in that, in that business or build that factory or do whatever. Right? So it changes the, the things that people would invest in. This is really important because um, certain industries are very sensitive to this. For instance, real estate. Right? Part of the reason we get a big real estate bubble is because that's one of the assets, one of the business sectors that is most sensitive to changes in the interest rate. Right? So that seems like something that's really important. Um, and then the last, uh, last thing is that inflation can actually create business cycles. So you guys have probably all talked about this um, in your courses before, but when the Fed lowers the interest rate, that means people save less, they go out and spend more. Uh, businesses, partly because they see people spending more, but also because the interest rate is lower, they want to take out new loans. And so that increases economic activity. Then later on, the Fed raises the interest rate, people save more and don't buy as much, and businesses, now they've got this you know, half-built factory and they've got less people demanding their goods, and so that causes problems for them, right? And then we go into a recession. So we can see inflation a lot of times contributing to um, business cycles rather than, as our goal might be, to have the Fed dampen them. Okay, so all these are reasons why inflation is important. Um, okay, so then we can also think, well, what was the problem of the Fed? Why? They, we wanted them to do all these great things, and it looks like they're not any good at it. Well, why is that? Well, again, if we think about how economists would normally want a market of competitive suppliers rather than a single monopoly supplier, we can think that the Fed has some systemic disadvantages, right? Because it's only one. It can't do as good of a job as many people competing in the market. Right? So one thing is the Fed doesn't face any competition, so uh, it doesn't have to worry about whether people like dollars or not. It just puts them out there. Right? Doesn't necessarily care about protecting the value of the dollar. Whereas if we had competing banks, they, they probably care. Right? The Fed has limited information. Uh, it doesn't know about all the things that are going on in the economy. We have the Board of Governors that is really running the show there. And they can only know so much. They can't be everywhere in the United States, whereas if you have lots of different banks all over the country, they can all see what's going on in their local area, right? So even with the greatest monetary experts in the world, the Fed doesn't have all the information. They have a s systematic disadvantage there, right? They also have this uh, a problem because of the law of large numbers that we would think many, many, um, many banks competing, if they're all issuing money, well, some of them might issue too much, and some of them might issue too little. But on average, they're probably going to get it right. Okay? The Fed does not have that luxury. The Fed's got one money supply. It's all, all the US Federal Reserve notes in the country. And either, it either gets it too high or it gets it too low. But there's, you know, it's not always going to get it right. Whereas if we have lots of people doing it, we can think that on average, they probably will. Um, because they only manage one money supply, the Fed has an inflationary bias, that they think inflation is better than deflation. When we have natural deflation from, from um, economies getting better all the time, from becoming more productive and more technology, then prices should actually go down, right? If it's cheaper to produce goods, we should see prices fall. Uh, so we can have some natural productivity deflation, but when the Fed causes deflation, it's because they put too little money, money into the economy. Right? So that can choke off economic activity. So the Fed doesn't want that. So they have a little bias that they think, we are always going to err on the side of caution. We are always going to have a little bit of inflation. They aim usually for 2% inflation every year. Uh, and so that's, again, why they, we see systematic inflation under the Federal Reserve, where we wouldn't see that with competing banks. Okay. And then the last thing I have here is political influence. Again, that's something that you all have talked about, that even though we think of the Fed as being independent, that's something that economists might claim is true, it's clearly not true if we look at history. Right? The Fed is very sensitive to um, who's in the White House and um, what they think should be going on. And so uh, I think that that's, there's some pretty clear influence there. Okay, so we talk about all these disadvantages of the Fed. Um, it, seems, it seems weird to me. I mean. It looks, like, it looks like, to me, the Fed has failed on every margin. Like, why do we have a Fed? Why should we put up with all of these things when we know economically that having a competing system would probably be better? 
Um, I mean, that's a little bit hard to answer. I think that a lot of the people, so economists, I think, first of all, some of this research is rather new. I mean, the thing that I was saying about now, now economists like Christina Romer look back at the uh, 19th century and say, no, wasn't so bad. Recessions, not too long, not as many banking panics. Um, that research, again, it's rather new. Probably a lot of economists are just not aware of that. Um, and I think, you know, if Christina Romer were to say the kind of things that I'm saying right now, well, she wouldn't have been chairperson of the Council of Economic Advisors, right? It's, it's dangerously um, politically to say that kind of thing. Uh, I think some other people would say, well, the great moderation proves how great the Fed is. Right? For 30 years or so, we had very low rates of inflation. But again, if we look back, uh, if we look back at how good GDP growth was and how low inflation was during during the period before the Fed, even the Great Moderation doesn't compare. Right? Even the even the best time under central banking was not as good as the time before central banking. Right? Now that's that's hard for a lot of economists to think of because we talk so much about the Fed and we talk so much about our fantastic theories of money and how we can manage it and how great we can be. Uh, and so I think it's a little bit hard for people to realize that that's just really not the case. Uh, and so they, they look at these things and they say, well, it's true. It's true the Fed is limited in all those ways, uh, but it's still important that we have one because they think that we couldn't do better without the Fed. Right? So let's talk now about some alternatives to the Fed. Um, you guys have already talked about the gold standard, so I won't say too much about this. I think... Um, the gold standard generally just means that we're going to define the dollar in terms of gold. Right? Our monetary unit is going to be based on some value of gold, and it can be issued either by a central bank. Early in, the, in um, the Fed history, they did redeem dollars for gold or silver, uh, or it can be issued by private banks. Right? So, so either one of those things would be called a gold standard. I think of the classical gold standard as being private banks providing the money, um, but some people would also say, well, when the Fed provides the money, that's a gold standard too, right? So either one of those things um, would qualify. Um, the main idea, though, the reason that we would think this is stable is because the quantity of the money is based on supply and demand. So I talked about this in your class a few weeks ago. But we can think, again, if the economy is growing a little bit every year, then we're going to need more and more money every year. And so the owners of gold mines, the producers of gold, are aware of that. When there's too little money in the economy, that means the value of gold would go up, and they would have an incentive to produce more gold. Right? When there's too much money in the economy, the value of gold goes down, and they don't produce as much. Okay? So we can think that the supply and demand are going to adjust to give us the quantity of money that is demanded by the market. Right? So I, I think as economists, that's something that's kind of easy for us to understand, right? supply and demand, and yet we normally don't think of that in terms of money a lot of times which is kind of odd. Um, historically, when we look back, again, um, gold led to very low levels of inflation. Okay, I talked about, again, in the class the other day, that during the greatest periods of inflation in US history, the, uh, under the gold standard, when we had the gold rush in California in the 1840s and 1850s, and then again, a similar one in Australia, 1850s, 1860s, we would have thought uh, now, looking back, I mean, some economists would think, look, all that gold coming in, that's got to have created a ton of inflation, right? Uh, but it turns out it didn't, right? I mean, when we look back, clearly there was inflation over a 10 or 20 year period, but it's something like, I believe the um, calculation for Mol Rolnick and Weber is 1.75% inflation during that period, whereas, again, the Federal Reserve shoots for 2%. That's their goal. Okay, so even the worst periods under the gold standard better than the ideal periods under central banking. Uh, Greenspan did 2.25 on average <laughs> this 19-year tenure. Right, okay. So historically we see that even the Fed shoot, normally shoots a little bit over their goal. Right? And then I, th I talked about last time also uh, the greatest sustained inflation was what we call the great inflation in Spain. Um, and that was something that was when the gold was discovered in America, and Spain was bringing it back from their American colonies, gold and silver. And so gold and silver in Spain 
goes throughout Europe and raises prices across the board in Europe and all these different countries. But even though they had this very long period of inflation, something like 75 to 100 years, uh, the price level only tripled b over that time. So it's something like 1.5% uh, inflation per year. Again, much lower than what we what our ideal case under the Federal Reserve. So it seems like gold did a really great job. Now, could we reinstitute a gold standard today? Some people would say no. Uh, it would depend, of course, on whether we're talking about a gold standard internationally or just for the United States. Clearly, it's better if lots of countries are on the gold standard because then we can all trade and it makes it easy. Um, so that we couldn't right now. I mean, the U.S. is unlikely to talk other countries into doing that. But it is possible that we could introduce a gold standard in the United States today. In other words, President Obama could come on TV tonight and say, the U.S. is moving to a gold standard. Now, um, now, there have been some estimates about what, what this would mean for the U.S. economy. So uh, Walker mentioned that I studied under Larry White at George Mason. Larry White had a paper, I think, a year or two ago saying that, look, if we took the amount of gold that the U.S. owns and decided that the U.S. had to redeem all of our dollars for gold, if we fix dollars at the current price of gold, we have enough gold to have about a 20% um, reserve ratio, right? Which is, which is pretty high. I mean, most banks right now keep a reserve ratio of about 10%. So it would be roughly double what most banks are keeping today. Historically, banks had a higher reserve ratio, something around 25 or 30% in US history. Um, but we could see that the US has enough gold, and this is assuming that, assuming that there actually is gold in Fort Knox. I've heard some people say that there's actually not any there. Uh, and uh, uh, economists have told me that they have it on good faith that there's literally nothing in Fort Knox. I, I consider that to be kind of a conspiracy theory. So assuming that the US has the gold that it claims it has, we could switch to a gold standard today and have a very stable 20% reserve ratio. Right? So it's entirely possible. Is it a good idea? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it seems like that kind of a big transition would be a little bit difficult. If the US were to completely change to a gold standard today, that affects all the gold in the whole economy. Right? Whereas what I'm going to talk about in a minute here is um, competing currencies, introducing new currencies to compete with Federal Reserve notes. So that's something that can be introduced gradually rather than requiring a major one-time change like a shift to a gold standard. Okay? So changing to a gold standard would be possible, but it might be difficult. Right. Another thing that you guys have talked about is 100% reserve banking. Uh, so this is, again, depending on who is issuing the notes, if it's the central bank or the private bank, they have to hold 100% reserves, I'm assuming in gold here, for any notes that they issue. Right. So this is something that's great because it's a constraint on inflation. It's very hard for the, for the central bank to inflate the currency supply because they have to buy more gold in order to issue new notes. Right? Another thing that you guys have probably talked about is that this prevents bank runs because there's no reason to run on the bank if you know the bank has all your gold sitting in the vault. Right? So that's, that's great. Those things are, are good advantages of 100% reserve, uh, but there are some problems with it. So for one thing, if private banks are issuing the money, well then they, they can't make a profit on 100% reserve, right? I mean, because normally what they do is they loan some of that money out and they earn a profit on their loans. Well, if they have to keep it all in the vault, they, they can't loan it out. The only thing that they can do is charge a fee for it, right? So if you want your bank to give you a note and charge you a fee to keep your gold in the bank, you can do that today. I mean, every, goal, every bank will have, give you a safety deposit box and just charge you some fee and you'll have a little receipt that you can bring back. So, I mean, 100% reserves, in, in my opinion, if we're having private banks do it, is not really that helpful. Uh, we could have the central bank do it. Again, we could say the US government is going to uh, issue banknotes, and instead of having a fractional reserve, they're going to keep 100% gold on reserve. Um, that would be all right. It, we wouldn't have as big of a problem of inflation. We would still have some of the issues that we talked about earlier that, well, the government doesn't really know how much money to put into the economy. Even if they have to buy it somewhere and then issue it, they don't know exactly how much people are going to need. Um, and so that might cause a, more of an issue for them. Right? Now, opposed to 100% reserves, I know that some people um, are in favor of that. I actually think that fractional reserve banking is not that bad. So the first thing, there, there are really two issues about fractional reserve, right? One, people say, one is that people say, it's fraud. 
It's not fraud. Come on. That's not fair, I don't think. Um, the second one is that they worry about inflation. Okay, so for the fraud issue, I, I, I don't really see why that's the case. I mean, it seems like um, if you have a contract that says the bank can loan out your money, then it can't be fraud that they actually follow the contract. I mean, I think when I ask my money and banking students today, do you think that the bank actually keeps all your money in their vault? Almost all of them say no. A couple of people aren't aware that the bank makes loans with it, um, but almost everyone is. And I'm pretty sure that if they read their contract with the bank, it would say, we're going to take your money and loan it to somebody. Right? So as long as that in, is in the contract, I don't see how that can be fraud. I know I've, heard, I've had some people claim to me, well, it is fraud because two people can't own the same asset. And I think, well, they're not. If the bank loans it out, that's just like someone renting my car. We're not owning the same asset, I've lent it to them and they're paying me money to use it, right? So there's uh, the fraud thing I don't really understand. If you guys have some reason for thinking that's true, then you can talk to me about it later, but I don't really consider that to be a, an economic argument. It's more of a moral argument, right? But the other thing is that when we look back historically, I don't think it was actually historically the case um, that it was fraudulent. Now, Ronnie had an example the other day of Amsterdam. The banks in Amsterdam were fractional reserve, and when the people found out, they ran on the banks. I don't know about that, but I, I really liked a paper by George Selgin where he talks about goldsmiths in England. Okay, so goldsmiths were uh, early banks in England. People would bring them their gold, and the goldsmith would hold on to it and give them uh, a deposit note for it that they could come back and redeem later. Right? So they essentially acted like a bank. Um, and if we look actually at what they were doing at the time, people had two options when they bring their money to the goldsmith. One is we bring it to you in a box or a closed bag, and you just put it on the shelf. You don't look in it and you don't mess with it. Okay? That's like 100% reserve. If you give the goldsmith that, and then he just stores it for you. And he'll probably charge you a fee for holding on to it. Okay? If you bring the money to your goldsmith and it's just coins and you give him some coins, that means that he has the right to take it and loan it out to somebody. Okay? If he's going to loan it out to somebody, then he can pay you interest. Okay, so it seems like if we're looking at that case, it's pretty obvious that people know the difference between giving a closed box, that means your money won't be lent out, or giving in coins, they, they know it will. And they must have known that in one case they're paying a fee, so their money is not being lent out, and in the other case they're making a return, so their money is. Right? The goldsmith wouldn't have been able to pay them a return if he weren't lending their money out. So I think, I think historically, I don't know about everywhere, but at least in England it appears to be the case that it was not a fraudulent agreement. Right? It was something that people were aware of when they were doing that. Okay? Um, and I think actually, economically, when we worry about inflation and we worry about bank runs, I think these aren't really issues uh, either. I think that historically, when we look, uh, you know, I'll talk about the United States in, a, in just a second, but we saw low levels of inflation for the US before the Federal Reserve. The banks were doing fractional reserve lending. and low inflation, some bank runs. When we look back now at that period, it seems like the bank runs weren't as bad. As I told you before, financial panics didn't seem to be as big of a deal as people perceived them. We used to worry that wildcat banks were a big deal. Um, wildcat banking is when a bank s sets up in some small town and issues a bunch of banknotes and then pretty soon just closes and all the people are left with their banknotes and the bank keeps all the money. Um, people used to think that was a big problem and then Rolnick and Weber from the Federal Reserve did some studies and showed that it was actually really rare. Uh, and I think most economists think now that interstate banking, laws that prohibited interstate banking, actually caused a lot of the bank runs at the time. When banks were unable to move money from a place where it was plentiful to a place where it was scarce, that causes runs on the banks because you can't get liquidity into your banks when they're having problems. So I think most, most people would agree that in US history, fractional reserve didn't cause problems with inflation or problems with bank runs. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about free banking. So this, I think, is important because it's important to understanding why it might be useful um, to have private banks and what their, or private banks issuing currency and what their incentives would be. So when I say free banking, what I'm really talking about is I'm thinking of banks basically just being treated like any other firm, that they're nothing special, that they don't get special privileges, that they don't get FDIC insurance, and they're not protected in any way uh, the way that they are now. Right? I think that they should 
like any other firm, if they take risks, they should fail. If they do well, they should profit, and that, that there shouldn't be any other special arrangements for them. Okay, um, and that also means, of course, that it'd be a lot easier than it is now for banks to enter the market because they wouldn't have high burdens in order to be able to get in. They wouldn't be as regulated, and so um, we could have lots of banks that were different in their design and their size and whatever. And I, so I think I think that that would be a, a little bit. Um, better of a situation for, again, the, situa the, the reason that, that I said earlier that as economists, we should think we want competition, right? We should think we want firms to be, be free to do whatever they want. So it seems a little bit odd that we should say, no, 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 banks are different, right? Unless we have some really strong reason to think that would be the case. I mean, if I told you, you know, no, 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 food is different. We need to regulate the food industry, and we need to have really strict protections, and we need to give farmers bailouts and whatever. Yeah, I, I would think as economists you would say, wait, 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 that's, that's not true. If you want to do that, you need some really strong evidence, right? Same thing about banks. I think we should just treat them as, as, special, as regular firms and not as anything special. Uh, money, I think, also we should treat as just being a regular good. And money is a good. It happens that it's something that we trade. It's a little bit different now that we're using fiat, but certainly when we had gold, you know, gold was just a good that people could trade. Some of its use was as jewelry or uh, as in technology. People use it now in computers. But at the time, part of its use was just being traded, right? So if we think of money as a good, then we can think money is not anything special. There's no reason that we should just throw away our normal ideas about supply and demand just because of money. Now, some people make the argument, well, money is special because money uh, has network effects. Okay? So if you guys aren't familiar with this, the discussion of network effects is um, as more people use it, it makes it easier for the next user. Right? If more people are using money, if all, the if all the stores in town are accepting the type of money that I want, then it's easy for me to go spend my money wherever I want. Right? Uh, but if no stores in town are accepting the money that I have, well, then it's not useful to me. Right? Why should anyone want to use that if nobody's going to accept it? So the more people using a certain type of money, the better it is. Okay? So people say, money's special because it has network effects. Well, lots of things have network effects. You know, VCRs have network effects. DVDs, the, the Blu-ray versus whatever the new technology is there, you know, they're arguing over which one is going to become dominant. That's network effects. Facebook has network effects. You don't want to join Facebook unless lots of your other friends are going to join it too, right? So just because we see that doesn't mean that money is anything special. Lots of goods have that characteristic. And I think there are probably some other things that people would point to and say, money is different, right? But I, but I would say, well, those things we see with other goods in the economy, you know, why isn't Facebook different? Why aren't DVDs different? Because they have network effects, right? I think if we think of money as a good, then we can see why... Um, Regular economics can be applied to the banking system, and we can think that we'll come up with some pretty good outcomes. Right? I think if we, if we just use some very standard economics, then we'll see that there are good reasons to, to believe that free banking might be the optimal system um, for our banking system. Right? Um, and that, uh, another slight angle on that is, uh, a lot of times when I say we can have banking without a lot of government regulation, people say, well, we can't eliminate, reg eliminate regulation because people are greedy. In the world that you want, it would only be good people. We, we, we don't have all good people, and because people are greedy, we need more regulation. Okay, again, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's actually the opposite of what I'm trying to say. I'm going to argue that people's incentives, it's competition that makes a free banking system work. Right? It's the fact that people are greedy that makes the system work. In the same way that we would think of any other good, that competition is going to be good, that people can only gain if they voluntarily exchange, and they're only going to do that, they're going to provide things for other people because they're self-interested. Okay? So this is, again, just like you would think about any other type of economics. I think if you apply your regular ideas about economics to money and banking, we'll see that a free banking system, system can really work. Okay, so first of all, let's think about money issue under free banking. So like I said, the banking system, what we want is, the ideal is, for it to issue just as much money as is demanded by the people in the public, right? And the exact amount that is needed in the economy when we want supply to meet demand, okay? So a lot of people worry, well, if private banks are doing the issuing, then they'll just issue tons and tons of money, 
right? But I don't think that's the case. So let me, let me talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> the fundamentals of banks, uh, kind of in terms of the same way that Ronnie did when he talked about balance sheets, OK? So we can think of the bank as having some assets and some liabilities. All right, so assets and liabilities right here. And we can think that the way that the bank works is somebody comes in and deposits some money in the bank. Okay, so let's say Trey over here has $100 in gold. And, he and I'm just going to say gold because I'm going I'm, to, when I'm talking about fractional reserve, you know, for a long time in the US they used gold. And I'm going to talk about issuing redeemable bank notes. So let's say he has $100 in gold. Okay, and he brings it into the bank. What the bank does is says, okay, we'll hold on to that $100 and ignore banknotes for a second. We'll just say we'll give you $100 worth of deposits. Okay. So deposits is good for Trey too, right? Because he can spend that anywhere. He can write someone a check and they'll be willing to accept it if they trust this bank. So now Trey has deposits. Okay. So what does the bank do? The bank takes that money and at first they might just hold it on reserve. So let's say they have 100 in reserves. And if you have fractional reserve banking, then this is all they can do, right? I mean, if you have 100% reserve, that's all they can do. If you have fractional reserve banking, then the bank can take some of this money. So let's say the bank only holds 10 on reserve, and they make loans with uh, 90 here, OK? All right, and this money goes out, and Matt here takes out a loan. Matt's going to Matt's going to start a tutoring company and tutor people in economics and make a bunch of money. Okay, so Matt takes out this money, right? Now ha Matt has $90 in cash or in gold, right? So Okay, so now we have the bank has created money here, right? So we know that fractional reserve creates money. Um, and the bank here is going to make a profit. So, so these, of course, have to add up to 100 on each side. And in this case, let's say the bank makes 10% uh, on its loans. Well, that's $9 for the bank. And if they pay something like 4% on their deposits, then they have to pay out $4. And so their profit is $5. Okay. So we can see it's pretty obvious that the bank can make a little bit more money by loaning out more, right? If they, if they ho only hold $5 on reserve and loan out 95, well, then their profits are going to be higher, right? But what's the danger of that? They worry about bank runs, right? So the issue is um, that Trey, with his deposits, he can come in and redeem them anytime, right? Demand deposits. You can just come in any day and demand that the bank have his money. Uh, now, it's unlikely that he'll come in and do all of them at once, or if this were a little bit more realistic, we would have 100 people on this side, each depositing some amount, and some portion of them would come in and withdraw their money on any given day or week or whatever, right? So the bank, over time, gets some idea of how much money is going to be withdrawn in any day, and so it keeps reserves on uh, it keeps money on reserve in order to satisfy those redemptions in any day. The more that it keeps on reserve, the safer it is. The less uh, that it keeps on reserve, the more unsafe it is because people might come in and demand their cash, right? So the bank faces this trade-off, okay? I've got some profit opportunity from having lower reserves. However, I've got some probability of failure from having lower reserves, right? If I raise my reserves, I'm more safe but less profit. Okay, so just like any business, we should think that the bank has to make some profit maximizing decision about there's some probability that I'm going to fail, um, but there's also you know, some, amount, some return that I get, and it's got to make the uh, marginal revenue equal to the marginal cost, right? Marginal revenue from the cash, marginal cost in terms of probability of failure. Okay, so we should think, just from regular economics, the bank doesn't have an incentive to issue too much money. They have an incentive to issue the amount that they um, that they can for their cu customers, depending on how often their customers want money and how much they can earn in their loans, right? How willing customers are, are uh, how much the customer is willing to pay for loans, okay? So we think the bank has some kind of profit maximizing decision. They're not just going to go out and issue tons and tons of money, okay? So all, automatically, just from the risk of bank runs, we, we can see that the bank has some incentive not to overissue its currency, okay? Now, the second thing here is called adverse clearings. Now, 
adverse clearings works like this. So Trey has his, has his $100 in deposits, and let's say he comes in and wants to use five of them. You know, he writes a check to someone for five bucks. Okay, so suddenly Trey has uh, $95 in deposits. The bank goes down to 95, and the bank has to pay out some reserves, so their reserves go down to five. Okay, so these go down 95, 95. Okay, so the bank, their deposits, um, or actually, let's, let's think of this in terms of banknotes. Pretend instead of giving de deposits, they give trade banknotes, right? I mean, this is the same kind of math. It's just whatever we call it. Okay, and instead of deposits, he has, the bank has notes that they've issued. Okay, so somebody comes in, they redeem $5 worth of notes. Okay, so their note issue has gone down by 5%. Their reserves went from 10 down to 5 Reserves have fallen by 50%, right? So when somebody comes in and, and redeems money, that affects the reserves a lot more than it affects notes, right? I mean, before they, they bank, if they, if they were, you know, again, making their decision, marginal revenue equals marginal costs, they think that holding 10% reserves, that's optimal, that's the amount that they want, and then suddenly they've only got half of that, that's a big deal, right? I mean, they've gone from being 10 to 1, 10 reserves to 100 notes issued, to now being 19 to 1, 5 on reserves for 95 in notes issued. Right? So that's a big deal. If they want to get back to their 10 to 1 ratio, well, they've either got to recall $45 in notes, or they've got to go out there and buy $5 in reserves. Okay? So they have to be extremely sensitive to this because of, um, because when there are note redemptions, it much, the, the effect on their reserves is much greater than the amount the, the effect on their bank notes outstanding, right? So banks have to be very worried about um, when people are going to come in and, and reserve their uh, cash in their bank notes that it affects their reserves a lot, okay? This is also a bigger problem if any one bank tries to overissue because as the bank issues more notes, their note supply becomes a bigger portion of all the notes in the economy, right? So it's more likely that their notes are going to be redeemed. You can think if you have several banks and they're all accepting each other's notes. Um, you know, if I'm a quarter of the note supply, um, then I expect to get a quarter, uh, like a quarter of the notes that come back are going to be mine. If I decide that I'm going to issue more notes so that I can make more profits, well then maybe my my notes go up to being 40% of the note supply, and then you know one out of every four that comes back is mine, right? And so then, so as you issue more notes your notes become a bigger percentage of the supply, you're even more likely to have people come in and redeem an even a greater effect on the, on the losses of reserves. Okay? So, so again, the banks have to worry about having an equilibrium here because they know that they're very sensitive to if they, if they overissue just a little bit, that makes them very susceptible to bank runs. Okay, so it's not like, it's not just a very basic trade-off. It's one that we, we should see a lot of feedback on the banks that'll make them, give them an incentive to be overly safe, right? Um, and if we look back in U.S. history, we see that compared to most theories of the number of banknotes they should issue, U.S. banks usually issued less than that. And, and there's this big discussion, a series of papers that people have written about why did, why did banks at that time issue so few notes relative to what we would expect from them, right? Um, so that's another idea is adverse clearings. The last one is the price specie flow mechanism. So if you're familiar with this from uh, David Hume, he was already talking about it hundreds of years ago. And it's really the same idea. If some bank decides to overissue, or if all the banks in the economy decide to issue more notes um, than the public wants, well then, that means prices will go up. Okay, so we get inflation in the economy. That means that prices from other countries, right, goods in other countries become cheaper relative to our local economy. Okay, so people um, want to buy things in another country. They're probably less likely to use banknotes. They're more likely to get some gold and send it overseas. Okay, so the specie flows out. When our price level goes up in the country, specie flows out of the country, and that means that we, again, have a problem with not having enough reserves. Right, it's just like adverse clearings, but on an international level. Okay. So price specie flow mechanism is the same thing. It's going to keep not only one bank, but all the banks in the economy from overissuing. Okay, because if, if they do, they'll lose all their gold uh, and they'll have to either buy more gold or call in their bank notes. Right? Okay, so all those things, that's just some regular you know, fundamentals, uh, economics about why we should expect 
if banks are profit maximizers, that they won't just go out and issue tons and tons of notes. I know a lot of people think that, but if you think about the fundamentals of it, there are some good reasons why they would not want to do that. Right? Um, okay, so... Oh, yeah. So, again, you have the situation that banks have to be responsive to the amount demanded. Okay? They have to um, understand what people want and the, uh, the uh, process of, of adverse clearings and deposit turnover. Give the banks an idea about how much money they should be, sh be issuing. Right? Every single day, they can count how many people came into our bank and redeemed notes. So they know every single day have a measure of how much people are demanding and how much people want. Right? Does the Federal Reserve have that? Not so much. Right? Banks get Federal Reserve notes and they just reissue them and they just keep flowing throughout the economy. The Fed only monitors big macro level stuff. They don't track each dollar bill the same way a private bank would. They don't have adverse clearings to give them a signal of when they're over issuing or under issuing. Right? So that's an advantage that, th that private banks have that allows them to match supply and demand. Okay? This would also have the advantage of encouraging banks to hold more reserves. So. Um, if we look back in the periods before the Federal Reserve and specifically before the FDIC, we see that banks were holding much higher levels of reserves. Right? Again, something like 20 to 30 percent. So empirically, it seems, to, it seems that we have economic reasons to believe that banks would act in a safer manner than they do today. And when we look at the historical data, it turns out they did. Okay, regulation. I know that I said that this is not really a job of the Federal Reserve, but, uh, but it's something that's important. Um, and so we can think that banks on their own, they have some incentive as profit maximizers to limit their th risky activities, but they also have some other incentives and mechanisms that they use. So banks quite frequently used to regulate each other. They would join cl clearing houses where they were uh, redeeming each other's notes. And when you remember the clearing house, um, you had to meet certain standards, right? You had to agree to be audited by the other banks. So if you think, you know, if you think banks do a good job of hiding their stuff from federal regulators, you probably won't think that they'll be as good at hiding it from other banks, right? The other banks know what's going on. They know how, how a bank might try to hide its capital or disguise its, its reserves or something like that. So it seems like banks would be good people to go in and, and do those type of regulations. Okay? So banks would make rules for each other. Look, if you're going to be part of our clearinghouse, you have to have some minimum capital standards. You have to have some minimum level of reserves. And often they make that information public. Okay? So a bank on the outside of the bank would publish, this is how much gold we have in our vault. So that anyone that was worried about that and thinking about running on the bank would just be able to come up and see, well, I guess my bank actually has a bunch of money. There's no reason for me to run in. It's been verified by the other banks that they, they're actually holding that, so they're not lying about it. Um, so banks were auditing each other and making some of that information public. Uh, another thing, I think Ronnie maybe had talked about these a little bit, but uh, quite often banks had to, bank managers had to post performance bonds um, that they would have sometimes two or three years worth of their salary held at the bank in case if the bank goes under, then the manager doesn't get paid for the last two or three years. So that's a pretty strong incentive for the manager or the CEO or whatever to keep the bank safe because if the bank goes under, they lose a ton, right? It would be pretty amazing if we had that situation today in America. That, that would be, I think, you know, much uh, safer banking activity if we did that. Another thing that they would do is double or triple liability. So this is if the bank goes out of business, then the depositors or whoever holds um, liabilities from the bank can sue the, or I don't even know if they had to sue. They, they, um, they had legal access to the assets, the personal assets of the bank owners. Okay? So if you own a bank, you got to be really careful that that bank doesn't go out of business because you lose your house, you lose all your private property uh, if your bank goes down. Right? So again, these are reasons to think banks are acting in their own interests because they're part of a clearinghouse and they don't want the other people in the clearinghouse failing, but it has, they have good reasons to act in a safe manner. Okay, and so, so we, see that, we see that clearinghouses did that. They also acted as lender of last resort. If a bank needed money, um, then they might bail it out. If they thought it was illiquid, not if they thought it was going to fail, right? If they think it's going to fail, then they just let it go. Um, sometimes we would see if a bank fails, then the other banks in the clearinghouse would say, we'll accept those other banks' notes uh, at par, and you can just come deposit it in our bank. And they would do that 
part probably just to gain new customers, right? They would just say, if your bank failed, come bank with us. We'll, we'll, we'll count their notes as good. Um, and so those are ways when banks all acting in their own self-interest come up with probably a better regulatory system than we have today, right? So we can think that these banks, they're competing, they're acting self-interested uh, in their self-interest, um, and they come up with better regulations, right, than we, than we have today. So I think that's pretty, pretty interesting. Again, something that we might expect in theory, and we look back and see that it was probably the case. Okay, so I told you before that, um, that banks had, I mean, that there was basically no inflation um, for 120 years, basically, before we had the, seven, the Federal Reserve. So here I have a graph starting in, in 1792 because that's when the U.S. government started coining money. Before that, money was mostly left to the states, and a lot of states had their own coins or their own state banks or whatever that they were using. And in 1792 is when the U.S. government started. So in this early period there, the uh, U.S. government... Um, there, there really weren't that many banks around. You guys can't see this very well, but th these are, this is a shaded kind of recession bar here. I mean, it's not to indicate a recession, but you've seen those on other charts, right? So what this is going to indicate is the price level, there were some wars and some minor things here that were kind of making the price level jump around, and there weren't that many banks. But here, right here with the War of 1812, that's when things really shoot up, okay? This little area right there, that's when we see huge inflation, okay? Um, and so then after that, price level falls, becomes pretty steady again. Then the Civil War, it shoots up again. Okay? So somebody, I think when we, when we talked about this before, I said um, price level here, very stable for more than 100 years. I think Matt said, yeah, but you don't just worry about the level, right? You worry about the volatility. Okay? Well, if we look at this 100 years um, versus the 100 years since the Fed, I think Price volatility, when I look at the standard deviation of changes, it's basically exactly the same. Um, and that is, that is even considering, even counting these two huge times of inflation that were caused by war, right? If we hadn't had those big war times, it probably would have been much lower um, before the Fed during this period, right? I mean, we can't really say for sure. Um, but I think it's pretty obvious that those, those big spikes were caused by those two wars. So we really kind of have three different periods here. Um, this period where we didn't have a whole lot of banks, this period in the middle where we had a lot of state banks, and that's when all the clearing houses were starting to develop around the United States. They had them in a bunch of different regions. Uh, Ronnie, I think, talked about a couple, but one of them that he didn't mention was the Suffolk Clearing House that, that uh, you know, was this, in this area is actually considered one of the best examples of a private successful clearing houses that, that use all the kind of regulation and stuff that I talked about before. Um, when the Civil War started, the U.S. government kind of did a, a power grab that they needed some money for war. And so the first thing that they did was they went and tried to get a bunch of loans from private banks. And the ba bank said, uh, okay, sure, we'll, we'll make the government some loans. And then after they signed the paperwork, the government said, oh, yeah, and it's got to be in gold. Uh, and the banks were like, well, we don't have that much gold. And the government said, it's got to be in gold. <laughs> and so the banks gave the government all this gold, but then they didn't have enough to pay their depositors, and so they had to suspend redemptions. They'd said, all right, look, we can't redeem money for gold right now, um, so you know, we'll do it later after the war. Um, and so that caused some problems. Then everyone um, went to the federal government and tried to, tried to uh, get gold and the, the federal government didn't have enough and so they had problems, right? Because the government wants to be bringing in gold. So the first thing they try is getting it from the banks. That causes some problems for them and they can't get enough. So then they start issuing their own currency, the greenback, right? So they issue tons of greenbacks. They issue so many that within just a couple of years, the, the price has fallen by half, right? By like 50%. And so they realize people are no longer willing to take the greenbacks on after only a couple of years. So the next thing that they do is they decide, okay, so all the banks in the U.S. are mostly staying banks. We're going to force them to go national. We're going to force them to get national charters and hold U.S. government bonds as their reserves. So, so all the banks, and they didn't, they didn't technically force them. What they actually did was they imposed a very high tax on state banks and a very low tax on national banks. 
so that it was basically uneconomical. If you wanted to issue banknotes, you had to give up your state charter, get a national charter. And again, the goal of that from the federal government's perspective is now they have to hold our bonds. That's a new source of money for the federal government. Okay, so all that stuff is happening in the Civil War. That's why we get this huge inflation during that period. Um, and that's why after that period, it's all national banks. Now, the national banks tried to basically institute the same kind of clearing mechanisms um, that the clearinghouses has created. It was sort of a nationalization of those clearinghouses. And then after 1912, we get the Federal Reserve in 1913, 1914. And the Federal Reserve really just officially takes over those clearinghouses as, as the government's job. right? Um, and so all that period, we see a little bit more government and a little bit more government until finally it, it goes away, right? Until finally they just take over the, the whole money supply in the United States. Um, okay, so, um, but again, the point of this was that during that period when banks were allowed to issue their own notes, the, it looks like they did a pretty good job, right? They did a good job. Um, regulating themselves. They did a good job not issuing too much or too little currency. And so it seems like that's the kind of system that we should want to have today in the United States. Okay, so now I'm coming to the part where this is my plan for how we would accomplish that goal. I mean, we might think, we might think going to a very free banking system, and again, when I say I'm using the term free banking loosely, it would technically mean that there's no special restrictions on banks. Throughout US history, we always had special restrictions on banks. They weren't totally free, but relative to today, right? I should maybe be more pre precisely say that was a period of decentralized money issue rather than a period of free banking in the United States. Um, but one option today would, we may think, well, that should be the goal then. We should let all the private banks issue their own money. We should let them redeem it for gold. Um, but that's something that would be very hard to get to today. Okay, so what I want to propose is sort of a semi-private system um, where banks could issue their own notes that are redeemable for Federal Reserve notes. Okay, so the idea again is if we, if we think about a bank, how it works, we can think the bank can take in some Federal Reserve notes, hold those on reserve, and then issue, and then use the rest to buy securities, right? So um, if I'm Bank of America, somebody, somebody comes into Bank of America and they give me a Federal Reserve note, I say, thank you, here's a B of A buck. And they take that and they can spend it in the economy. Uh, and then I take the Federal Reserve note and invest it. And later on, somebody comes back, hey, I've got a B of A buck. I want a US dollar. And you say, great, here's your money. But as long as that B of A buck or that um, paper dollar is out in the economy, Right, when that private note is circulating in the economy, the whole time, I've got a dollar I can invest. Okay, so banks, the idea here would be they issue their own private notes, and then they hold Federal Reserve notes and invest them. Okay, so this um, is similar to some other systems. I mean, we can think, again, it's similar to what was going on in U.S. history. It's just based on Federal Reserve notes rather than gold. Uh, it's much more similar to a few other regions today. Uh, so Hong Kong, Scotland, Northern Ireland, uh, I didn't put Macau on here, but you know they have this kind of system where in all of those countries, there is some government uh, notes, but the government notes are held by the private banks and the private banks issue their own currencies. Right? So, uh, so all these, all these countries, the, the private banks are able to profit by issuing their own notes. And I don't know if I should really say countries. I mean, Hong Kong is part of China, right? A special administrative district. And Scotland and Northern Ireland are both part of the United Kingdom, but regions um, where there, there is a government that issues the notes, um, but the private banks are, are actually the ones that uh, hold on to the note. I mean, that issue the bank notes that are used by the public. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about those in just a second. Local currencies, again, you guys have talked a lot more about this. I think that probably most people are totally familiar with, uh, unfamiliar with all these, but you guys have heard a bunch about it this week. Um, so you are much more familiar with the local currency idea than a lot of other people are. But I mean, that's an example where that's already going on in the United States, right? We already see some small scale private banks issuing currency, uh, and you can come in and trade it for US dollars. Right. That's essentially what they're doing. They're not using the same plan. They're doing it for different reasons, but it's the same type of activity, right? Mechanically, it's the same sort of thing that they're doing. And I think if US banks did this today, we would see more stability for the reasons that I talked about with free banking and more product variety, notes that people like and wanted rather than just whatever the US government gives them. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about these different things here. First, I want to talk about the things that are going on in, in uh, other countries here, or other regions at least. So Scotland has a long history with uh, private banks. Okay, they're generally considered, I mean, uh, the Scottish history is uh, one that a lot of people consider the most free banking period ever because they had very low regulations, banks could enter and leave the market, um, and they had, they had a lot of success, su success with it for a long time. Um, Northern Ireland only more recently, right, since um, 1929 has started that, uh, but they have the same kind of situation where they had uh, several private banks that are all issuing currency that is redeemable for UK official Bank of England notes, right? So in those areas, if we look at Scotland and Northern Ireland, we see that people greatly prefer private bank notes to government bank notes, right? It's something like 95% adoption, which seems a little bit weird, right? Why do people want to use the private ones rather than the public ones? I mean, the public one is not as good. I mean, sorry, the, <laughs> the public one is, is official. It's legal tender. You can guarantee that if you go into a store and pay with it, they've got to accept it. Private bank notes, they're not legal tender, right? So it seems like there's a disadvantage there, and yet everyone prefers to use those. That seems a little bit curious. Um, but it's very successful. You know, all the banks publish all these notes and um, earn a lot of money doing it. I, one, a, a recent estimate, the Bank of England estimates that banks in Scotland and Northern Ireland earn $200 million annually just by accepting Bank of England notes and investing them while they give people their private bank notes. Right? That's a lot of money, and it seems like in the US it would be even much larger. Um, the uh, situation is pretty similar in Hong Kong. Hong Kong doesn't have a central bank. What they have is a currency board. right? So the currency board, again, manages the value of the currency, but the private banks are the ones that issue all the cash, the, all the paper money, right? So the, the currency board, they issue gold coin, or not gold coins, they issue coins, and they issue just a little bit of paper money, but almost all the, almost all the paper money in the economy is produced by private banks. Again, very high adoption rates. People almost exclusively prefer the private notes, okay? And Hong Kong, it's been very, very successful. Uh, their currency board, I mean, has done a great job managing it, and their their money is one of the highest in international trade. People hold lots of Hong Kong currency because it's so stable, because it's so useful, right? Um, and so, so, you know, probably most of that is because of the currency board and not necessarily because of the competition. But the high adoption rate seems like that's just because the private banks do a better job. Otherwise, people would just use the government money, right? So why do they do that? I mean, I assume that part of it is because they trust these banks and they think it'll be more stable. I mean, pro probably uh, most of the people just don't care. Most people, I imagine, in an economy are just like, yeah, sure, I'll take whatever you have as long as I can spend it. Right? As long as whatever store I go to is willing to accept it, I don't care what's on your notes. Uh, however, I think there are some people that, that actually do prefer product variety. People prefer the pictures and the, uh, the colors and styles and stuff. And I know, I know, but, like everybody thinks that's silly. Um, but I think it's definitely true. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at these different countries, especially, I mean, Hong Kong doesn't have that much variety. Hong Kong mostly puts a lot of animals. They have like dragons and lions and stuff on their banknotes. And like, I don't know, I guess that's kind of cute. But Hong Kong and, I mean, Scotland and Northern Ireland, there they have a lot of variety. So the banks compete by putting pictures of different famous people. It's not usually politicians. It's usually like, um, so let me think. In Scotland, they had uh, Robert the Bruce. We, we didn't watch Braveheart, but if you've seen Braveheart, you know, he was one of the guys that fought with Braveheart and kind of betrayed him and then came back to his side in the end. So he's a hero in Scotland. So they put him on the money, right? I mean, if you're a private bank and you want people to, to take your money, put the hero on there, right? Another one they put on is uh, Lord Kelvin, right? Famous uh, scientist. They put him on the money. That's pretty popular. They put a soccer player, George Best, right? I believe that they've had golfers on their money before. I mean, that's pretty neat. I, I would think people would like that. I don't know. I, I, not everyone. Again, most people probably don't care. But I suspect that there is a small minority of people that, that really like that. Um, Northern Ireland, I mean, why don't we have the same kind of thing? You know, we don't have anything in the United States except for presidents on our notes, basically. Northern Ireland, they have a, a note with the US space shuttle on it, right? To celebrate 
celebrate man going into space. Do we have that? No. Right? But we could, if private banks were doing it, we might have stuff like that. In the, in the paper where I, I wrote, I talked about this and I said, people might argue over whether the Le LeBron banknote is better than the Michael Jordan banknote, right? I mean, people, people could have all kinds of sports figures and sports teams. Um, we could have famous celebrities. It could be like the Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie dollar, right? You could have different, in different areas, they could have whatever the college football team was. I mean, I, I, I imagine that people would like that, right? Being from, from Texas, I'm sure that if we had Texas Longhorn banknotes, people would want to use them. People would definitely go out and want to have some of those. Um, AIER, they could have the Colonel Harwood banknote, right, if we wanted to issue our own banknotes here. So again, that may not make a difference to a lot of people, but it would make a difference to some people. And if you want to get this kind of system started in the United States, that's what you need, right? You need some people that are going to be attracted to it from the very start. Uh, and so I think that that would be a good hook in order to get people interested in this. Um, and presumably, once it gets going, then people would like it better. I mean, I don't, I don't think in any kind of short term that the US would re reach any kind of the adoption rates that Scotland and Northern Ireland and Hong Kong have. I mean, that's amazing. Um, but if some people like those notes better, why not let them use those notes, right? And it seems like we should want competition. We should want variety um, in our bank notes. OK, so local currencies. Like I said, I know that you guys have talked about this. I imagine that most people aren't really aware of it, but you know, in the United States there are several different areas where local banks do issue currency just on the small scale, just for their own towns. And so you guys have seen the Berkshire ones in this area uh, that you can buy the, the Berkshire note as a, at a discount. I think that it, I think you buy it for, yeah, so you buy it at 95%. So, so I go to the bank, I give them 10 US dollars, they give me 10 Berkshires plus 50 cents. Yeah. Okay. Because it's got to be, when, it, when, I go in, when I go in and spend it in a store, it's worth the same thing as a dollar. Yes. Yeah, so I'm, I, I think the discount comes up front. So, you know, I spend, or I go in and I give them a $100 bill and they give me $100 in Berkshires and five bucks back. Right? And then I can take that $100 in Berkshires and I can spend it anywhere in town, or at least in the places that accept it. Okay? So in that way, they're giving people a discount. It's, it's kind of a coupon system, but it, it's intended to create more local business for those stores. Right? Uh, I don't know whether, it's, whether that's really worked out or not, but they're still trying to make it happen. Ithaca Hours is the same thing. Um, they've been doing it for a long time, and so they have some rate that they exchange it for the dollar, and then you can spend it in all their local stores. Right, so um, I think that Ithaca hours. Well, actually, I don't remember. Uh, if you look in my paper, it says they they both have hundreds of thousands of dollars outstanding in their currencies. I think that Ithaca hours is a lot older, and so they've issued over time millions of dollars of Ithaca hours. Um, that means that all that time that the bank has had money to invest. If there are $100,000 outstanding in Berkshires right now, then the local banks have an extra 100 grand that they are putting in, the, in some kind of investments, either loaning it out or buying stocks or treasuries and they're earning returns, right? So they are making money on this and at least some people like it, right? There are some people that are pleased to go out and spend it. The goal, whether it's effective or not, the goal is to create more business. And so, um, so that's, you know, that's a win-win if everybody, I, again, I don't know if it's necessarily profitable, um, but the businesses, at least in their estimation, expect that it will be, right? So that's, that's the kind of transaction we should want to encourage, okay? We should want people to be able to go out and make any kind of business deals that they want. We shouldn't be closing people off from this kind of thing, saying that only the U.S. government can issue currency, right? We should want smaller ones to be able to develop. So... If we, if we look at all the different ones, and I think, I think there are something like a dozen different local currencies in the United States. Uh, if we look at these, these give us some idea about how we could introduce a new system of private banknotes. Right? We can at least we can look at the 10 or 12 or whatever and see, okay, what's worked for them? How have they convinced people to take their banknotes? 
How do they convince people that that's a better idea? What do people like about this, right? Do people like the pictures? Do they like have, using it at their local store? What, what do they do with it? Um, I don't know, but it seems like we can at least learn from those as how we could get private bank notes uh, started in the market, at least how we could get some small footholds because it's been successful for other currencies. You know, why wouldn't a private bank be able to do that as well? Uh, the problem is that it doesn't tell us anything really about the legal question. And so what I mean by that is it's technically legal to, to issue private bank notes, but no major bank is doing it. And so we don't really know if, if Bank of America or Wells Fargo or somebody tried to start issuing bank notes at a national scale, what the government would do, right? Whether the Fed would rebel, whether the Treasury would sue and try to take them to jail. Uh, so I see that as, a, as an unresolved issue. I'll, I'll talk about the legal problems in just a second in more depth. But it seems like this doesn't really tell us what the government's response will be because it's clear that all of these will, will, are intended to stay local. right? They're not intended to scale up to a national level or anything. Um, and so it only gives us a little bit of insight into the legal situation. Okay, so then what would be the benefits of a semi-private system like this? I've talked generally about the benefits of free banking, but a little bit more specifically, if we were going to only have a sort of semi-private system like this, would it really have any effect? I mean, people say, well, uh, it doesn't matter because the U.S. is still printing all the money. Even if private companies are issuing the physical dollars, you know, they're holding U.S. dollars, and the U.S. government can still inflate if they want to. Yeah, that's kind of true. Uh, but it seems like there, again, are economic reasons to think that having private banks issuing the money would inhibit the Fed's ability to inflate, you know, inflate the money supply. So the first one, obviously, is that, well, it cuts the amount of Fed currency that's in circulation. Okay? So if banks are issuing some of the currency, people are using less Fed currency. And so if the Fed issues more currency, well, then that means the private banks will only be able to issue a little bit less because they have to meet demand, right? If the public is only demanding a certain amount, then uh, they won't be able to continue issuing. Okay? They, they should at least um, inhibit the amount of currency going into the system when the Fed increases the amount of currency. Now, that may not be such a big deal because Inflating the currency is not really the Fed's main goal, right? I mean, we can think the, the currency supply of, of um, the currency supply is something like 30% of the um, money in the U.S. monetary system. So it's a, you know, it's a portion of it. So we could maybe limit inflation on the currency supply, but what about the rest of it? Uh, so there are reasons to think, actually, that we would also limit the rest of it because this would reduce the money multiplier effect. Okay, so the, the Fed plans on, the Fed expects that when they go out and they buy or sell treasuries, that that money is going to go into a bank, and then the bank's going to loan it out, it's going to go into another bank, and it's going to go throughout the system, multiplying its effect with each bank, right? So this should inhibit the money multiplier effect, because uh, if the Fed issues more money, right, then banks can't issue as much. They're going to hold a little bit more on reserves, and more reserves in the banks means a lower multiplier. Right? So we should, we should think that not only is this going to inhibit just the currency amount, it's also going to dampen the multiplier effect. Um, however, of course, the Fed will still have significant influence, I think. You know? So depending on whether you think the good Fed is good or bad, and what, at whether they're effectively able to manage the money supply, then you might like this or not like it, right? If you're afraid of the Fed messing it up, well, this seems like a good feedback effect um, that they could damp dampen any damage that the Fed might do. Uh, on the other hand, if you think that the Fed is really important and necessary, well, then they at least still have a lot of power under the system, right? Just a little bit less. Um, Okay, so that I see as being one of, the, one of the main things is, you know, we talked about economic stability and having the proper quantity of, of money as being kind of the most important thing in the monetary system. So I think that's really number one. Again, the thing about um, aesthetics, about colors and pictures, I think that's pretty important. A lot of people wouldn't really care, uh, but I think it's pretty clear that that's something that people like, right? Again, why, why do people choose to hold that kind of money in Scotland and Ireland? Why do they hold the private notes instead of the government notes? Uh, there must be something that they like about it, right? I mean, partly I think it's just tradition, but partly I think they probably like them better. And I think the same would be true in the United States. 
Uh, another one is that the private banks might provide better security features. So uh, they might do things like invest more in the magnetic strips or whatever is required, the, the watermarks that they put into banknotes. Uh, I've seen some um, electronic or I've seen some websites talking about electronic readers. So apparently they have, they have smartphone applications that you can buy to read U.S. bank notes and verify the denomination. And it's something like $1.99, you know, $2 to have a bank note reader on your smartphone. So it seems like it can't be that expensive to have something that will verify, that would verify private notes as well. In fact, it might be much better. Um, we don't know. I mean, it's hard to say, you know, the Fed is probably not going out there and competitively finding the best supplier of currency. They're not going out there and trying to get the best security features they possibly can. Uh, private banks might do that. They might try to make it a lot better. Um, but it's not for sure, right? We don't know for sure what would happen. Any private company has to match uh, marginal cost and marginal revenue. So it could be that the private notes, you know, don't have a bunch of enhanced features. We, we don't know. It's hard to tell because the Fed's got a monopoly. We don't know what a competitive market would look like. Uh, presumably, if we think about it, if we think about other markets, if we think about privatization of airlines or telephones or whatever, what may happen is that it might be expensive for private note issuers at first, but once they get competitive bidders on people that are able to print the money, on people that are coming up with new security features and new readers and whatever, that the price would fall over time. Right? So that's something that you know, we've seen in other industries. It's plausible to assume that that same kind of thing would happen uh, with money. Right? Yeah, OK, so where are we going to start with this? Um, I think the first thing is to think about this, as, again, as getting a foothold as a local currency. I think that if a bank, a major bank, can get the same kind of exemptions that the local currencies have, I think they're, they have some legal exemption to be able to do that, um, that a major bank would be able to introduce a new currency. I think it would require some major marketing initiatives um, in order to make people aware that they were even doing this, in order to make people more reassured that the local uh, businesses would accept it, and I think the banks would have to build a network of local businesses in order to make people comfortable that when they went out and wanted to spend a dollar that people would, be, would take it. Um, and another thing is I think they could pay people to adopt these. Okay? So the idea would be um, that you could earn some interest on your bank notes, or it, it might be that if you get it from an ATM th that the bank that the ATM says, you know, do you want 101 B of A bucks instead of 100 US dollars? And you're like, sure, I'll have that for the extra dollar. Um, or it might be something like paid interest. I mean, Discover Card pays interest. Uh, airline miles essentially do the same thing, and those are effective. Those companies keep doing it because it attracts customers, right? I think if you paid interest on your notes, um, that that would probably work. That when, the, when somebody returns the note to the bank, they get a little bit more than what they, what they paid. Uh, do you need me to close immediately, or do I have a... Okay. All right, so um, I had a couple other things that I wanted to cover there uh, about how exactly that would work mechanically. But if you want to, you can just read my paper. I go through a lot of detail about what the incentives would be and how we could possibly introduce that. And I talk about how uh, some problems, people think cash is on, on the decline. I don't think that's really true. Um, just from the studies that they do, I think it would be very profitable. And I think the legal problem is really one of the biggest ones. Because it's possible right now that you, know, you could go to jail for doing this. And so we want to make sure that that's not the case before anybody actually does it. So I think, you know, from my opinion, it looks like the Fed has completely failed, that free banking is a good alternative system, and that this kind of private banknote system is a good step towards getting there.